नमस्कार न्यूज क्लिक में आपका एक बार फिर से स्वागत है आप देख रहे हैं हमारा बहुत ही खास कार्यक्रम इतिहास के पन्ने हम लोग ये कार्यक्रम अमूमन हिंदी में करते हैं या हिंदुस्तानी में लेकिन कभी कभी ऐसा होता है कि हम लोग उसको अंग्रेजी में भी करते हैं हमारे जो मेहमान हैं उनके कंफर्ट उनके लिंग्विस्टिक कंफर्ट क्योंकि कई बार क्या होता है कि द लैंग्वेज दैट वी आर स्पीकिंग इन और राइटिंग यू नो दैट एक्चुअली गेट्स ऑन टू अर टंग स्पेशली वेन वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट मैटर्स विच आर टेक्निकल और यू नो और रिलेटेड टू सम डिसिप्लिन इट हैपन्स टू मी ऑल्सो ऑल द टाइम आई हैव ग्रोन अप इन नॉर्थ इंडिया आई कीप ऑन टॉक स्पीकिंग इन हिंदी but there are occasions when i have to lapse into english it comes very automatically so we will be talking about a uh, lot of issues today uh, primarily about uh, it all stems from the fact that in india today over the last 3 and a half 4 decades uh, religion has become the major uh, marker of social identities we first categorize an individual on the basis of the religious identity of a person has it always been like that Do, you know these questions actually come up you know a lot we are going to be talking to uh, dr amar sohel who is a research fellow at the cambridge university and he has uh, written a very fine book called the muslim secular the book is here and may i welcome uh, dr uh, amar sohel amar uh, to be uh, you know more on a, on a first name term so please call me nilanjan also uh, congratulations on this very fine book which i have read substantial parts of it i intend to read some more bits of it in the next few weeks and i intend to you intend to speak with you on another subject matter also related to this book also today i am going to be uh, let me first give an introduction to what this book is about to our viewers you know this book is essentially takes a look at the muslim secular parity and politics of india's partition that is the title of the book now essentially to convey it very simplistically it is essentially taking a look analyzing uh, portraying three muslim nationalist leaders who were active in politics through the national movement and thereafter you have uh dr uh, uh you know abdul kalam you have uh, uh, khan abdul ghafar khan who uh, went away to uh, you know stayed in uh, uh, what is what used to be called the north west frontier province uh, stayed there also called popularly the frontier gandhi and then we have sheikh abdullah the central character often villainously portrayed by today's hindutva forces in kashmir we will today be talking about the frontier gandhi the reason why i want to talk about the frontier gandhi first of all uh, or ghafar khan uh, uh, amar is that you know when my generation was growing up uh, which is essentially we 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 started understanding you know historical characters or being able to understand a bit of politics uh, through the 1970s and then through the 80s at that point uh, the frontier gandhi you know was an iconic figure in indian discourse we all knew about somebody called frontier gandhi and felt very bad that he was eventually had to stay in a country which into which his heart was not there i still remember you know we had i had become a journalist by them that in 1987 88 you know when he was conferred the bharat ratna the kind of excitement which was there in india and then the immense sadness which took over india in january 1988 when he passed away and uh, indian prime minister then rajiv gandhi went there there was a bit of a diplomatic tussle between pakistan and india whether rajiv gandhi should be allowed or not etc etc but the point is that there was a certain amount of you know interest around uh, a character like that that has completely disappeared it's just a matter of sheer timing that january 1988 when uh, gafar khan dies you know that is the time when the hindutva forces take off the ram janma bhumi ayodhya agitation actually takes off in 1988 so it has really been one way it is a you know good for him you know that he did not have to see what happened into 
uh, the India which he dreamt of being part of. Now, what the reason why I want to first pick up uh, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan from your book is because I want to reintroduce him to today's Indians, you know, who are unaware of the vibrant, uh, you know, discussions which used to happen around him. So let's begin with uh, him. First of all, welcome to this program and thank you very much for sparing time. I know you are sitting in uh, London, uh, you know, trying to squeeze us through all your various research programs and libraries. Thank you very well, much. Uh, and, pleasure, uh, Vilanjan, to be here with you and to have this discussion. So let us, you know, essentially to start with, it has to be a beginner's guide to the frontier guide. Why do we call him the Frontier Gandhi? That is what today's Indians may want to know. What was it? You know, Pathans or the Pashtuns are normally supposed to be very brave, courageous and violent people. Mm. Where does Frontier Gandhi with the uh, notion of non-violence, where does it come in? How does it come in? You know, it's a fascinating story because uh, colonial mythology and, you know, Indian mythology too around the Pashtun has often been um, about his so-called violence. Yeah, so, so essentially, you know, he's having to confront this um, uh, uh, trope, if you like, the, you know, the stereotype around, uh, around violence. And this is often mm. how he's remembered as well, that, you know, as an anomaly, if you like. But of course, he's extremely popular as a political leader on the frontier. And um, he builds this Khudai Khidmatgar movement or Servants of God movement which, um, you know, dominates frontier politics for 15 plus years. Um, so in many ways, where does this frontier Gandhi label come from? Um, I guess it kind of takes his own agency away a little bit, but there is some, uh, you know, it does make some sense because like Gandhi, he was also interested in the principle of sacrifice, right? Um, both of these figures uh, wouldn't dare take a life, right? But they will willingly sacrifice their own. And their belief was that nonviolence was the only way to achieve lasting moral change in a society, because you can, through nonviolence, not only achieve the goals of the oppressed and, you know, reform their lives and improve their lives, but you also have the hope of softening the heart. And this is the kind of language they would use, softening the heart of the oppressor too. Right? So, mm -hmm. so really, um, this is... Um, the, the principle of nonviolence is one they share in common. However, um, you know, Abdul Ghaffar Khan works through this idea in very different ways. He uses Pashtun themes. You know, there's the Pashtun Wali, which is the ethical code of the Pashtuns, which mm. is an inherited code, which um, he, you know, remakes or repackages for a nonviolent politics. He takes concepts like forgiveness, uh, reciprocity between different people, and turns them into principles for nonviolent action against the colonial state. Um, and also to resolve Pashtun issues among themselves, among uh, different tribal uh, factions. And so uh, he's doing that. And on the other hand, he's also drawing on Islamic ideas of fortitude or sabr, right? And, um, you know, hardships are to be faced with perseverance, right? That, that he, he uses that. Uh, idea and takes that idea from Islam. So in a sense, he's not just copying Gandhi, uh, mm -hmm. which is often the kind of what we think when we think of a frontier Gandhi. He's doing right. something much more than that. He's actually anchoring nonviolence or nonviolent political action in Pashtun and Islamic themes, and then joining them up to a larger, a larger Congress movement, of course. Right. You know, uh, there is a general supposition in India, especially the India of today, is that uh, Muslims in India, Muslim leaders in India, especially during the uh, national movement, most of them were in favor of the two nation theory of the Muslim League, that is the, uh, pa the state of Pakistan. But in your book, you actually make out that, uh, you know, you argue that uh, the three persons about whom you write, who you become Maulana Azad, uh, Abdul Ghaffar Khan and Sheikh Abdullah, they were opposed to the Muslim League, not just opposed to the Muslim League, but they were also not the mere acolytes of the other national uh, 
nationalist leaders, that is uh, Gandhi and Nehru. Mm -hmm. So that means that they had their clearly well demarcated their own individual space. They were not just somebody who were actually, you know, hanging on to the coattails of Gandhi, uh, Nehru. Especially this is true about uh, Maulana Azad uh, because he became, you know, he was part of the Nehru ministry and a very important you know, minister handling education portfolio at that particular time. So where does the, the, the thing which I'm trying extremely curious to understand from you that where does Abdul Ghaffar Khan's uh, you know stands against the Muslim League against a separate Muslim kingdom his understanding his visualization of the Indian state you know like I uh, read you know that you actually point out hmm. that he argued that uh, uh, pan-Islamism is collapsing and that the future of Indian Muslims lies in a political alliance with the Hindus of the country. Where does that imagination come from? Oh, absolutely. And so, see, there, there, are many, there are many things going on here and it's right. worth breaking some of these things down. The first point is that um, people like Abdul Ghaffar Khan, and it's true of Sheikh Abdullah and, and Azad as well, Malana Azad as well, that they believe that Muslims are so... Um, powerful in India in the sense that they do not have to worry about the prospect of being a, a, a disempowered minority uh, or, or a you know, weak minority in a united India. They have provinces of their own, right? Uh, they also have the largest Muslim population in the world. This idea that they're a minority that is under threat um, is a misnomer. It's a possibility in a divided India, but not in a united one. And so Abdul Ghaffar Khan famously says, you know, that we are 90% Pashtun uh, Muslim. Muslims um, in the Pashtun province are 90%. Um, the idea that we can be dominated by outsiders, whether, whether the British or whether in an independent India from Delhi, doesn't make much sense to me. Um, and so what he ends up doing, and Abdul, it's the same for Abdullah as well, they end up anchoring... Islamic identity in the region, right? So Pashtun identity, Kashmiri identity becomes wrapped up in a kind of uh, cultural Islam. And by doing that, they end up um, being able to negotiate on very different terms in Delhi. They're not, they're not worried so much about what to do with our religious identity. We have a regional home for that. So once we establish that regional home, we can have a relationship in Delhi with, with, with other Indians, whether Hindu or Sikh or Christian or so and so on, mm -hmm. on very different terms. So this idea that we need Pakistan or we need something separate um, doesn't uh, play out in the same way as it does for Jinnah, who, of course, is coming from a minority uh, uh, position. Right? Of course, Azad then confronts that in different ways, but that's a whole other story. So for Abdul Ghaffar Khan, it's not really... There's no threat of Hindu uh, dominance. Uh, and so that's what plays into it. The other second point, which is also very important, is that if you have a partition, he believes, if you have a partition, you will institutionalize hatred in this place, right? Indians, um, Hindus and Muslims have a history of both love and hatred. You know, Shruti Kapil has written a brilliant book on, uh, on this called Violent Fraternity. And the way we understand Hindus and Muslims um, uh, having this relationship in modern times, um, of, which is both positive and negative. And Abdul Ghaffar Khan, like all Indian political thinkers, understands this very well. And he thinks that if you have a Pakistan and a Hindu majority India, you will essentially have these two um, diametrically opposed states battling off against each other. And what that'll do is all that hatred, all that antagonism will be elevated and all that love and friendship will be uh, pressed down or, 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 or right. somehow, um, you know, shunted to one side. So that's another very important reason why uh, he believes from a very ethical position, and he's a very ethical thinker, we, can, we might get into that. Right. Um, partition has to be refused because it divides, uh, it divides people up and will produce this kind of, um, uh, you know, angst and anxiety in the subcontinent for, for decades to come. And, and who is to say he was entirely wrong? You know, there is something which comes to my mind because, uh, you know, having uh, spent a, a greater part of the four decades that I've been a journalist, uh, 
and writing essentially about the rise and growth of the Hindu right wing in India. One of the points which is constantly made by what we call the Sangh Parivar is that India is secular because of the Hindus. India is a tolerant country because of the Hindus. Whereas uh, we find that a lot of intolerance within the, the political actors of the Hindu right wing today. And also what comes across in your book is also uh, something which is absolutely diametrically opposite about this. I, I would like to hear you, you know, hear from you about this. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the thing is that, you know, and I think you will agree with me that religion can be um, manipulated or mobilized um, for both positive and negative projects, right? It can be, right. uh, and I think that's true of Hinduism and Islam. Uh, for instance, these figures, they're quite interested in the heritage of Hinduism in India. It, you know, they also kind of make this point that actually Hinduism has enshrined within it uh, a tolerance which assists the project of Indian nationalism. But they also mm. argue that Islam has within it an idea of the universal. That is to say that Islam believes that we shouldn't be divided on the basis of race, on the basis of difference. Mm. And that's a special idea for them which they want to enshrine in the in the nation, essentially. They basically uh, take the view that if you divide land up or divide territory up and pit you know, one set of human beings against the other, that is a uh, contravention of Islam. Uh, the, you know, so, the, so, so in a way, the creation of Pakistan is a contravention of Islam, according to them, because Muslim universalism is so important. It has baked into it the idea of positive human relations. So I would say that, you know, it's very convenient for, you know, uh, Hindu nationalism today or, or, or versions of Muslim nationalism of yesteryear, perhaps, um, to, make the, to make the claim uh, that, um, you know, these are separate uh, religions, these are separate systems, and, you know, they can't meet in some way. Uh, and certainly the idea that, you know, uh, it's the Hindus who've allowed space for the Muslims. Um, that is uh, one argument, but these guys are kind of reframing it slightly differently and saying that Mus Islam and Muslims can also make space for the other, which is perhaps not a very convenient or popular argument today. Right. You know, you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, Abdul Ghaffar Khan, the organization which he floated, uh, you know, the uh, Kudai Khidmatkar, uh, and then, you know, let's look at the trajectory. They do become part of the Congress. He becomes part of the Congress at some point, you know. So yeah. within the Congress, how does he function? Does he, you know, is he, as the word which I picked up from, you know, one of the reviews to your book, you know, is he an, is he, is he an acolyte of the Gandhi, uh, you know, and the other Congress leaders at that time, Nehru is on his way to becoming a big you know, stalwart of the Congress through the 1930s when, Abdul Ghaffar Khan uh, merges his organization into the Congress. So where, what is his space within the Congress and how does it, uh, how does he articulate his worldview uh, of uh, the Indian nation? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I definitely uh, would say that he is, of course, an ally of these figures, but he's also an independent thinker. That's right. Well. That is most important to understand that where is it, what is his, you know, his independent thinking, you know, what, how is it different from that of Gandhi and uh, Nehru? So the core, there are a few things. A, a really important thing here is to understand that, you know, one of the reasons why he's been dismissed so easily is because his language is caught up in um, Pashtun concepts, you know, from this inherited code of the Pashtuns. Right? So he's using ideas of honor, obligation, reciprocity. Mm -hmm. And these things are, you know, tied up in that ethical code. And people and historians have also been guilty of this. Um, I've just kind of dismissed him as a Pashtun thinker, therefore, and therefore only interested really in what happens to the Pashtuns. And uh, everything to do with the Congress really is some kind of opportunistic alliance. That's how it's been, you know. That understood. is the understanding. But it's not like that at all, because he uses these things. He thinks that, look, um, everyone is capable of upholding, you know, the honor of their friends. You know, I, if I uh, agree mm. to protect you, you can protect, you can agree to protect me. And we do so not out of self-interest, but because uh, we want a better future. We don't want to be in this colonized situation anymore. 
and we also love each other, you know? And so there's a lot of um, nation building that goes on, you know, at Congress sessions, you know, trying to understand each other's cultures, you know, meeting, uh, meeting Bengalis, meeting people from the south of India, and trying to get them to understand Pashtun culture and vice versa. And that's how you build the nation right? in this way, it's through direct um, communication, through direct relations, through these meetings. Because there's, of course, this divide. There's a trust deficit also, because the British have said okay, that once we leave, um, you know, the Pashtuns are going to come and swallow you. This is what they say, right? Uh, and then... Uh, Likewise, there's the myth of Hindu Raj being uh, perpetuated, um, not just by the British, but by others also. So, so there's this effort to kind of, um, is a real effort to undo this thing through um, uh, social relations between Indians. So that's one so, thing. Sorry. No, no. Uh, you know, listening to you. So one question, you know, arises in my mind, you know, that having made, uh, you know, so much of effort uh, of a united India, of an India, you know, which are space for, you know, across religious identities. When finally India goes in, into partition, when the Mountbatten plan makes and the Congress leaders accept, he must have been terribly heartbroken because he did not, his politics did not have space in the in Pakistan, what eventually came out. We all know that in uh, the Pashuns, the referendum there, you know, and, and uh, yeah. you know, he stayed out of the referendum to him uh, notion you know the, the of an independent Pashtunistan did not exist in the referendum so That's right. you know he would have been terribly heartbroken i can't imagine that how he lived four decades the last four decades of his life with so much of pain and uh, anguish in his heart yeah i mean he also had you know to just go back slightly to your previous question and then link it to this one which um you know, he's very um, impressed by the, the, the Nehruvian model. So he's mm -hmm. thinking on his own terms, but he's also impressed with the idea of the socialist state, you know, a strong uh, socialist state which can um, enact development uh, and reform, especially in agriculture. Oh, and, and equality, economic equality, all. Yeah, as well. So there's that going on. So yeah, he's extremely heartbroken because that vision comes crumbling down. He also thinks that the Congress has this idea of uh, linguistic provinces. You know, there's talk about this ever since the 1930 Karachi conference of the Congress. Uh, mm. There's thought that, you know, you can have linguistically divided up uh, states in India, like we do today after the reorganization, right? And so he he's attached to that idea as well. You know, he's not like Abdullah who wants to retain uh, political power uh, in a very like concentrated sense in Kashmir. He's actually quite right. interested in Nehru's idea of a strong social center, which is something that socialist center, which is something that historians have previously kind of um, looked beyond. So that vision comes crumbling down. Partition, of course, for him is a terrible thing. It's great for Jinnah because Jinnah believes that, you know, uh, this is the only way to protect the minority. And it's uh, that's one argument. Right. Um, but but. For Abdul Ghaffar Khan, this is a betrayal of trust, right? So we started with that whole thing about trust and obligation. You do, you protect me, I'll protect you. That crumbles down. He thinks that the Congress has um, reneged on its pledge, if you like. Um, it's defaulted on, on the promise that it's made. And he sees this as a great betrayal. The referendum question is very interesting because the referendum is also extremely unfair, according to him, because it's the only province which gets a referendum. Why does it get a referendum? Because it's the only Muslim province in India which has a Congress government. And That's right. Whereas all the other provinces got to choose through their assemblies, so indirectly, the assemblies, uh, the members of the assembly, chose whether to put Sindh or, you know, UP into India or Pakistan, respectively. Right? Uh, for the frontier, that was a problem because the Congress would have voted in the assembly to take uh, the frontier into India. That would have mm -hmm. meant a very strange geographical situation. Something a little like what you had with Eastern West Pakistan. This Eastern West Pakistan, there would have been, yeah. you know, a, a Northwest frontier of India and, and, and the rest of India here. Exactly. And so, in fact, some of the uh, Khudai Khidmatkars, and, and this is this comes out in Mukulika Banerjee's book from 
quite a while ago, a great anthrop anthropology of uh, the movement. And, you know, some of these figures tell her in that book that, uh, well, you know, um, we could have had uh, this if, if Pakistan could be East and West. Why can't India have been like that? But it was thought that this would be an impractical, you know, impractical kind of um, situation and, and it wouldn't have uh, um, worked. That was the consensus be uh, uh, within Congress as well as with the Muslim League and, and the British, of course. Um, so this kind of singling out of the frontier uh, on ethical terms, uh, Ghaffar Khan thinks is terrible and it's it's injustice uh, because it's, they're being treated differently. Uh, because before, when you had the battle between the Congress and the Muslim League in, in the frontier, it was a clear battle between secularism and communalism. And now the Congress was kind of accepting uh, so-called communalism. Uh, that really, uh, if it were to come into India, it would be unusual at this point. And because it's Muslim, it should uh, have a referendum. And that was thought to be... Um, and, and, and Abdul Ghaffar Khan could never find, uh, you know, political space in Pakistan. You know, he kept on going in and out of Pakistani jails. I think that is how right. a large part of his uh, four decades was uh, spent uh, that way. That's right. And I think actually um, uh, Abdul Ghaffar Khan provides a great um, uh, template for what Pakistan might look like. Because after independence... He basically says, well, you know, I rejected the partition of India, but we've had it now. What to do? The Pashtuns are in Pakistan. Let's try and make Pakistan a good thing. Let's try and turn it into a good thing. But it can't just be a state for Muslims. It has to also be a state for minorities. It also has to understand that Muslims are also divided among Sindhis and Punjabis and Pashtuns and so on. And therefore, they should have provincial rights in this country. And so what he ends up suggesting is a kind of socialist, developmentalist, but federal country for Pakistan, which is secular and democratic and all the rest. Um, it's a kind of, you might even, you know, dare I say, a Nehruvian type of vision for, for, for the other country. Uh, and this is what he posits. Um, and so I think what I'd like to, what I'd like to think is that, you know, um, progressive Pakistanis might yet uh, resurrect from some of the research I've done, perhaps uh, a vision of their country which 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 is quite different to the one that emerges. You know, I was actually thinking. You know, uh, you know, we can continue to talk about uh, you know such important characters in history for hours, and we'll still not be able to discuss everything. But the, the this particular medium has very severe limitations, and I was actually wondering that. How do I exactly start summing this up? You gave me one word, you know, that you hope that the progressive Pakistan, people in Pakistan resurrect uh, Abdul Ghaffar Khan. Question is that what can Indians, Muslims, as well as the Hindus, what can they learn and why is it necessary to resurrect uh, Ghaffar Khan now, Abdul Ghaffar Khan at the moment in the extremely, you know, intellectually as well as, uh, you know, community-wise, a divided and a badly splintered and full of prejudice, that kind of India which exists at the moment. Why is it necessary? I mean, it's a huge question, Nilanjana. Yeah, it is a huge question, <laughs> but we are actually grappling with this all the time. Of course, of course. I mean, you know, here's a thinker who is a humanist, uh, who uses Islam... Uh, for universal ends, he can he, he interprets Islam in such a way that it can encompass difference. And I think there's absolutely uh, you know when when you think about uh, the way uh, Indian Islam has developed after partition, it has developed in that within that trajectory. In fact, you know, and mm -hmm. whatever uh, other forces may or may not say about it, um, you know. Maybe the example to, to take here is from something that happened in 1930, right? Uh, there was a massacre in Peshawar okay. when, uh, you know, Khudai Khidmatkars were protesting uh, during the civil disobedience movement, uh, which was... The joint support of everyone. Absolutely, across the, uh, across the country. Uh, and this is really when they came to fame in, in, in many ways, uh, the Khudai Khidmatkars, because they were shot... Um, by British soldiers as they were protesting. 
And in the afternoon, that afternoon in, in April 1930, uh, um, a uh, battalion uh, from Garhwal in Uttarakhand, or today's Uttarakhand, right. uh, were, were to take over uh, from these British soldiers. And they were led by a man called Chandra Singh. And Chandra Singh refused to shoot the, the Pashtuns. He said, you know, they are just demanding their rights. How can I shoot these people? Um, how can I ask my, my, my soldiers to shoot these people? Uh, and Abdul Ghaffar Khan celebrates this moment because Chandra Singh and his, and his soldiers are, you know, uh, you know basically uh, taken off and, you know, uh, tried in the courts and so on. And he right. thinks this is a fantastic moment because here the nation has been made. You know, here the Hindus, the, the Hindu soldiers have stood up. Actually their... refused to fire on them despite orders from the government, you know. So, exactly. so they've but... refused and they've therefore made the nation through this act of nonviolence and they've created national love. And in many ways, you know, I, I thought of that moment when the protests happened around the CAA and RC, where you saw people come together from different communities. But for what was a Muslim cause at that moment, right, that was whether the Muslims are Indians or not, whether they are to be uh, given right. political rights or not. And so maybe we can take something from that, whether we are Muslims or Hindus or others. You know. Well, uh, thank you, Amar, very much. You know, actually, uh, you know, there has been uh, a, a growing feeling within a large number of people in India, especially the Hindus, which has been spread by the Sant Parivar, that uh, the Muslims always wanted... Uh, a separate nation for themselves. Uh, they were given one. Uh, a large number of them went away. Those who did not go away, they must stay here on our terms. You know, that is the way it's actually spelled out. So, Abdul Ghaffar Khan becomes very important because he stands contrary to, in, you know, against this narrative which is being built. Here is one of the tallest Muslims who were part of the national movement who actually fought for independence from the British did not want a separate, uh, you know, uh, country for the Muslims, but wanted a united India. So that is why it is very important that we uh, understand more about, uh, you know, uh, Abdul Ghaffar Khan at the moment in India. And your book is a very valuable uh, contribution at this time. And I am sure that uh, you know, whenever you get the opportunity to travel in India. You would be meeting in people. You would be talking about the book and about uh, these three uh, very important Muslim leaders. That not everyone wanted a separate country for the Muslims. That they were very much had the vision of a united India where religious identity was not the most important one. Thank Absolutely. you very much and congratulations, Amar. Thank Any, you. Uh, you were saying something last something. Yeah, just one thing. You know, like. Yeah. Uh, Muslim political thinking has often been associated with Jinnah, and rightly so. You know, he he, he was successful in, in achieving his project. Right. But Muslim political thinking is a plural domain, and it includes figures who opposed him, such as Azad, Abdullah, Ghaffar Khan. Just as among the Hindus, there was Nehru and, and Gandhi, there was also Savarkar, right? Uh, so this, this, this is a debate, which of course includes figures like Ambedkar also, and Beriyar, anti-caste figures. So this is a debate which encompasses all these figures. And really, right. that is our heritage in many ways. And it's worth exploring all facets of it. That's all and even, even among the Hindus, in today's India, not every Hindu thinks the way the Sangh Parivar wants them to think. There are a large number. In fact, the majority of Hindus are against the vision of the Sangh Parivar. And that is what possibly is the biggest hope for us. And we will keep on talking about the Abdul Ghaffar Khans and the Sheikh Abdullah's and the Maulana Azads to be able to convince those who actually believe in the other narrative that Muslims always wanted a separate uh, you know, country for themselves. Thank you very much, Amar, once again. Thank you very much, Nilani.